Hi folks, I'm James Harrison, Acting Director of the Institute of Employment Rights, and we're here today to record an in-conversation event between some of our excellent and dedicated experts who will be discussing the topic of fair pay agreements in New Zealand. Now, as many of you know, the Institute has long championed the idea of the restoration of sectoral collective bargaining in the UK. That's the tried and tested tripartite method of negotiating between unions, employers and governments to properly plan the economy and create a floor of pay and rights for workers that no employer can go below. This forces employers to compete positively on efficiency and investments rather than allow bad employers to create a race to the bottom with workers' pay, terms and conditions of employment. Fair pay agreements are one mechanism of tackling that race to the bottom and turning it instead into a virtuous economic circle. The topic of fair pay agreements has been more pronounced in the UK during recent times, mainly due to the UK Labour Party committing to a trial of fair pay agreements in social care. We thought it would be useful to reflect on how fair pay agreements may have been implemented elsewhere and hopefully learn what the pitfalls and possibilities are. So we reached out to Michael Wood, former New Zealand Labour Party Minister for Workplace Relations and Safety, who's kindly made the time to tell us more about New Zealand's recent experiences with fair pay agreements. Joining this discussion will be our chairperson, Lord John Hendy KC, and our senior vice president, Carolyn Jones, who's kindly offered to chair this in conversation event. So thank you all for joining us in what will no doubt be an informative and stimulating discussion. And over to you, Kat. Thanks, James. And welcome, Michael. Thanks for joining us today. So you were the minister responsible for introducing the legislation for extending fair pay agreements across your economy. That legislation was passed into law, but was immediately repealed with a change of government in 2023. Perhaps you can start by explaining to us the origins of fair pay agreements in New Zealand. Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk about our experience, and I certainly wish everyone in the UK well as uh, as you explore this area of policy. Uh, Sectoral-based bargaining in New Zealand has a very long history. Uh, it was first established in the 1890s via a legislative mechanism uh, and carried through uh, very substantially till 1991, when New Zealand uh, went from having one of the most regulated labour markets in the developed world to one of the most deregulated labour markets in the developed world almost overnight when the, the national or the conservative government of that time uh, introduced the Employment Contracts Act. And it, it, it more or less um, outlawed uh, the ability for unions to be able to bargain at a sectoral level um, and strongly put an emphasis on individual bargaining, not even enterprise-based collective bargaining. This was legislation that was so extreme that it didn't even mention the word union in our, in our main piece of industrial legislation. It was an attempt to, as a former leader of your own country has said, not just rewrite law, um, but re rewrite culture and uh, what people think. So that was the background that we faced. Um, by the end of the 1990s, union membership and collective bargaining had declined very significantly. It wasn't destroyed, but it was very significantly uh, diminished. And an incoming Labour government in 1999 restored balance to our employment relations framework with legislative reform that acted to stabilise the situation uh, around collective bargaining and union power, uh, but didn't significantly advance it. And it was fair to say that then by the early 2010s, there was a growing recognition uh, within the union movement and across other people who observed this area uh, that if we wanted to see substantial progress in terms of um, uplifting the well-being of those, particularly um, on very low incomes, who had been substantially de-unionised, there's going to have to be a different policy approach. And so really from the early 2010s, uh, trade unions, particularly those affiliated to the New Zealand Labour Party, did begin the work of exploring and developing alternatives. There was work that, that was done around a model of extension-based bargaining, taking existing collective agreements and expanding them out into sectors. Uh, but eventually it was determined that some sort of model of sectoral-based standard setting needed to uh, be brought in. And that was for all of the reasons that you identified before, putting a floor in place, stopping low-rider behaviour, and importantly, 
shifting our model of economic development from a low wage, low skill, low value model uh, to one in which we do incentivize innovation, competition and the stuff that drives prosperity and, uh, and productivity. And this eventually developed into a, into a policy within the Labour Party um, over uh, a period of opposition that we held from 2008 to 2017. And so by the time we were elected to government in 2017, it was quite settled policy within the Labour Party that we would have a fair pay agreements model that would be rooted in a model, of a, a system of sectoral based bargaining. Then further detail was developed once we came into government. So can, can I ask, uh, Michael, um, in in develop in in ex, in uh, formulating the principle of sectoral collective bargaining, and in formulating the mechanics of the way that fair pay agreements would work in New Zealand, was uh, much uh, in, international experience taken into account? In particular, of course, I'm thinking about the Wages Council's legislation in Britain from 1909 to 1993 but more generally um, elsewhere in the world? Yes, it, yes, it certainly was. So we, we came into government in 2017 with the, the framework as established manifesto uh, policy and a name, fair pay uh, agreements, uh, knowing what we wanted to achieve, um, but without the detailed structural and policy work having been done. So in the 2017 to 2020 term, um, further work was done, and in, in the New, Ze New Zealand system, we mainly have coalition governments. So we had a bit of an awkward situation in that term, uh, in which we had one party, uh, the Green Party, which supported the implementation of fair pay agreements, and another party, the New Zealand First Party, that mm, was pretty cool on the idea. So the initial step was to establish a working group, which was actually chaired, interestingly enough, by um, the Right Honourable Jim Bolger, who was a New Zealand Prime Minister. In 1991, the National Party Prime Minister, who had introduced the, the Employment Contracts Act, which had destroyed sector-based bargaining. Uh, and it's fair to say in the years since, he has reflected a lot on the tearing up of the social fabric that occurred in that period. So he was brought in to chair a working group, which was a not just a tripartite working group, it certainly had representation from trade unions and peak business organisations, uh, but also included academic and civil society representation. And the task of that working group was to survey um, our own historical experience, uh, but to also look internationally for different models uh, that we could um, assess and used to develop our own solution to the particular problems. And that working group did look widely. It did look at um, the UK model that you have identified. Um, it looked at contemporary models as well, um, including the very well-established sectoral-based bargaining systems uh, within um, the European Union. And probably quite significantly as well, the Australian modern award system, uh, because of the, the the cultural and economic closeness to Australia, it was something that was easily grasped and understood by many people as well. So that was brought in by the working group. A lot of analysis was done. Um, and uh, in the end, that working group recommended quite a bespoke system that tried to draw down the lessons uh, from uh, other systems that had been utilised by other countries. It is fair to say, um, um, as I understand it, your Wages Council um, did have a particular focus on sectors where it was identified that there was relatively weak bargaining power for those groups of workers. And in the development and design of fair pay agreements, um, that was a core objective. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Michael. Um, so having determined that se sectoral collective bargaining was the best way forward, what were the what would you say were the institutional and political battles uh, you faced in turning your ideas into effective policy? Well, yes, it was a it was a process that took a, a very long time. So as I said before, there was a lot of work that was done internally within the union movement, and that was not without some debate. Um, it, it never, it's never without debate uh, in the union movement. Uh, uh, and there were legitimate debates that were held there as well. You know, for example, uh, one of the major gripes of many union members and unions is, is free rider 
behaviour that those who don't contribute financially uh, to a union often receive the benefits of collective bargaining. The reality of sectoral based bargaining um, is that that happens writ large. Um, but the movement, I think, you know, had the wisdom to look a bit broader um, as to why this was an important way forward. So those sort of institutional debates were held. Um, that happened, we sort of had the, the weird advantage that this was happening while we were in opposition. And of course, while you're in opposition, there is a bit more freedom to explore these things. And really, over a number of years, the concept became quite normalised within the Labour Party. So certainly debates were held. But by the time we got to 2017, this was a very well established, normalised part of um, the policy framework that, every, that people were comfortable with within the Labour Party. It was still a courageous policy, though. It would have been um, one of the more radical policies that that we committed ourselves to at the 2017 uh, election. Uh, and a key part of that was that at the party leader at the time, Jacinda Ardern, um, retained a very strong and genuine connection to the union movement and was just utterly committed uh, to this policy. So that significantly helped to, with the internal work. Uh, then, as I said before, we faced a challenging situation in our first term in government between 2017 and 2020, where even though we were in government, we actually didn't have a parliamentary majority uh, to pursue the policy. And the New Zealand First Party, who we were in coalition with, did in the end stop any further progress uh, after that working group had, had done its work. So we had a proposal on the table that actually the government was not able to take forward at that time. And so some persistence was required internally to make sure it stayed there and was a part of our, our, our policy platform in 2020 where we did achieve a majority in our own right and we were able to push through. Um, of course, it was at that point um, when it was yeah, uh, within grasp, a, a very significant topic of political debate uh, was vociferously opposed by the parties of the right. More than any other policy, I think, that we introduced um, it went to the heart of the difference between the progressive side of politics and the conservative side of politics, uh, because this is a significant rebalancing of economic power and interests towards working people. That is the explicit purpose of it. Um, and, and you don't get much more fundamental in terms of the political fault line uh, than that. So a subject of you know brutal political assault. Um, from the other side of politics um, and uh, peak uh, business interests uh, for the most part um, swung in behind that uh, as well. Uh, but we were we were very um, uh, committed to the policy. Uh, there was internal um, challenges in terms of the public service position. So I'm coming to government in 2020. The first advice I received from uh, officials was that we shouldn't proceed with the policy. There are other more targeted ways of delivering support uh, to those who had inadequate income, et cetera, et cetera. Anything but tackle the structural realities that create the situation in the first instance. Uh, but we gave very clear direction that, that uh, this was government policy and it would be implemented um, and, and really the key thing uh, that I found gave us strength and enabled us to get the, the, the policy through with, I think, pretty broad public support was just having a level of existential confidence in the policy that actually if we talked it through with New Zealanders, uh, that most people had a basic sense of fairness and decency and the idea that the people who through COVID had cleaned our offices, um, had... Um, you know, kept our pantries full uh, at the supermarkets, who had kept driving the buses and keeping our towns and cities going while everything else was going to hell and everyone was scared and anxious. The idea that these people would just be left behind didn't sit right with people. And so we just had a level of confidence that we could, you know, as a Labour Party with the majority, uh, talk to the benefits of why it was right that working people received a fair day's pay uh, for a fair day's work and that we had to stop that race to the bottom. Uh, so yes, a lot of institutional and political resistance, um, but with a simple message that we kept repeating, we, we made good progress in terms of building public support. Nice. Uh, th thanks for that, Michael. And I mean, you mentioned the brutal political assaults and the opposition. Um, what level of opposition did you face amongst, uh, you know, from some of the employers, the social partners, and how did you uh, overcome that? Well, it's important to note that we did try to work very hard with social partners. The intention of the fair pay agreements policy um, is not just uh, to lift the pay and living standards and give voice 
uh, to working uh, people. Um, it is also a bigger picture about how we want our economy and our society uh, to develop. Um, and at its core, really, the idea of fair pay agreements is about re-establishing the social contract between government, capital uh, and labour, uh, that every, th every good or service that we produce has the contribution of both sides, of, of both capital and labour. So it's only fair that it should be negotiated out and then the fruits shared out equitably. Um, so we felt it was important, therefore, to, to have business at the table as we were developing the policy. And we very genuinely saw that through. They're a part of the core working party and we kept them closely at the table to consult with as we developed the policy. Even while recognising that they didn't support it, we felt it was important to have their knowledge so that we developed the best possible policy that could be implemented um, as effectively as possible. That, that largely went okay and was largely constructive. Uh, but as we got closer to a point of legislating for it, um, we faced a very significant uh, and extremely well-funded um, public and political assault uh, on the policy. Big billboards up in, in the cap capital city and our largest city, Auckland. Uh, significant newspaper, social media, uh, advertising, uh, and a, a very strong um, attempt to message and embed the policy as sort of a 70s uh, throwback. That was really one of the core themes that came through. Um, there was, wasn't just an attempt, but Business New Zealand uh, took the New Zealand government to the International Labour Organisation, uh, claiming that the policy was in breach of core ILO conventions, and that was, you know, thrown out fairly unceremoniously, but that was, you know, an attempt to scare a Labour government um, uh, away from a policy. There was a significant misinformation campaign, which, you know, for example, claimed that the country would be shut down by strikes when in fact strikes are not allowed in pursuit of a fair pay agreement and, and other examples uh, of that kind. Uh, there was also a direct attempt to, to sabotage the institutional design of the policy uh, because as we designed the policy, we did include substantial roles for both our Council of Trade Unions, our peak union body, and Business New Zealand, the peak business body, um, to steer the scheme through, uh, to potentially have a role in the bargaining process if parties weren't able to fulfil their obligations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we got to a point after having received undertakings that they would be involved, where Business New Zealand formally withdrew from that, really in att an attempt to make the policy design unworkable. We found ways around that uh, in the end. So yes, we faced the full force um, of organised um, uh, business interests uh, against the policy. We also had a range of businesses who were actually quite supportive, um, who saw the benefits at an individual level because they were businesses that were trying to do the right thing. Uh, and because there was no flaw, they could be undercut on labour standards. And also businesses who could see the bigger picture, who could see that some of the structural problems, um, um, poor skills and training, uh, bad health and safety outcomes, massive labour shortages in some key sectors in New Zealand were linked to our um, labour market and the poor uh, rewards that workers received. So we had that support, but very often that was quiet support. <laughs> the opposition we received was often uh, very, very loud. As I said, we um, we stuck to our guns on our core messaging and, and we had an approach of being professional, uh, of being polite and dealing with that opposition, but not letting it settle at all. Um, we responded instantly to misinformation, um, firmly and across all spectrums. And I think that helped us to, to, to manage the debate and make sure that people got the right information. Brilliant. You've got a lot of experience here. It's great hearing all that you have to say about it in terms of the support and the opposition. John, I think you've got a question. Yeah, um, Michael, can I ask a couple of questions actually about the the mechanics of, of uh, the fair pay uh, ag agreements? First of all, what, what were the conditions, the triggers for uh, in instituting a, a fair pay agreement in a particular sector? Did it come from the uh, minister or from the unions or from the employers or could it come from any of them? Yes. Well, well firstly, it was possible under the legislation uh, to initiate a fair pay agreement for either a sector 
uh, or for an industry. So they could go vertical or they could go horizontal. Uh, we had one fair pay agreement that was initiated for um, uh, bus drivers of um, public sector buses in New Zealand. Uh, and we had one that was initiated for all hospitality workers, extremely wide right across uh, an industry. Uh, fair pay agreements under the legislation cannot, could only be initiated by unions on behalf of workers uh, in that sector. And when unions um, initiate for a fair pay agreement in a sector, in fact, at all points through the process, um, those unions have rights and duties not just to their own members, but to all workers who would be covered by that agreement and, uh, and, and are covered uh, by it once uh, one was put in place. And to initiate for a fair pay agreement, there were there were two tests uh, that a union could go through uh, to be approved to move forward into a bargaining process. Uh, the first was a representation test, and that involved having uh, 1,000 workers in that sector um, who effectively petitioned for there to be a fair pay agreement covering their group. Uh, and um, uh, unions would have to go out, um, would have to have conversations with workers, and would have to get you know, solid physical evidence um, of the fact that those people, um, uh, you know, there was a form that was uh, put in place, that those people wanted there to be a fair pay agreement. Um, that was then um, uh, pretty thoroughly vetted uh, by our Ministry for Business, uh, Innovation and Employment, the government agency that oversaw this area, the checking of signatures, the calling up of people to check it was legit. Uh, making sure that the people who had signed it were in fact in the sector that the fair pay group agreement would be for, etc. So that was the representation test, and if that was met, a union could then proceed. And all of the fair pay agreements that were initiated uh, before the regime was repealed uh, did come through the representation test. Uh, the other pathway was what was called the public interest test, and that would enable a union to initiate effectively by saying uh, to uh, government that they believe that on certain public interest grounds uh, there was a case for there to be a fair pay agreement and there were statutory criteria that were set out for this around preponderance of uh, low pay, lack of collective bargaining, um, other tests like a high proportion of vulnerable workers like migrant workers uh, and other uh, evidentiary uh, factors that could be looked at uh, that would then be ass assessed uh, by the ministry concerned uh, before approval was uh, was given. So those are the two pathways, a representation test on one hand and the public interest test uh, on the other. A and that was a very deliberate design feature. Um, as we established uh, the regime, uh, we did believe it was appropriate that unions who are going to represent workers were the ones who would have to engage with workers and put forward a case for a fair pay uh, agreement. And we also wanted there to be as um, few hands-on from government ministers in the process as possible. Um, we didn't want this to be something that was subject from either side of politics um, to pushing or blocking. Uh, we wanted fair pay agreements to be initiated on their merits. Thanks, Mike. Michael. Just on the public interest test, was was there a, um, uh, was a pu public or state subsidy uh, um, an element of the consideration. I, I'm thinking of industries where where uh, government finance subsidises uh, employers, or uh, it's necessary to, for the state to grant licences or permits or that sort of thing. Or was that not not part of the um, consideration? No, that wasn't one of the specific criteria. Uh, for assessing under the public interest test. Although it is fair to say uh, that in a number of the agreements that were initiated in that first bout, uh, they, they were from exactly um, uh, what, what we call the, the, the funded sector in New Zealand, um, people who are often employed by private sector um, or charitable organisations, but ultimately derive their funding uh, from uh, from government. So you know, bus drivers are an example of that, uh, care workers as, as you're very familiar with, are an example uh, of that. Early childhood education teachers were a group who were initiated for an example of that as well. So even though that wasn't one of the tests, um, uh, the, the way that things panned out seemed to recognise that there were significant issues uh, in those sectors.
So just a, a, another couple of mechanical questions, if I may. One is that um, whenever um, sectoral collective bargaining is discussed, there's always a, an issue about how you define the perimeter of the uh, uh, bargaining uh, agreement. Um, so I wondered if you could say a word about that. And the other question, which is was in my mind, is that fair pay agreements always give the impression that the substance of what is to be negotiated is confined to pay which has got a number of aspects you know allowances and night work and antisocial hours and all the rest of it promotion perhaps um but what what other topics were specified as the minimum for uh, negotiation or, and was there a maximum were, were there certain um matters which couldn't be the subject of further negotiation like health and safety or I don't know what else. Yes, uh, two two very good questions, a and it is important to note that uh, you know this was a very big uh, and complex new structure that was implemented. Uh, so there was after we were elected with a mandate and a parliamentary majority to implement fair pay agreements in twenty twenty. You know there was a good eighteen months of very very solid policy work. That occurred to to work through questions of this nature. Um, it was a very substantial new piece of legislation that was was the output from that process, and all of this was worked through social partners and and others. Um, the question of defining the limits of you know you put in place a fair pay agreement, who's in who's out was an important one. One of the reasons it's particularly important in this case is that the mechanism by which fair pay agreements would be given life. Um, was via a piece of secondary legislation. So that's a really important design feature. Parties would bargain. Um, the fair pay agreement was then ratified, or if it was determined through arbitration, it would then be brought into force by a secondary piece of legislation uh, signed off uh, by order and council. And, and of course, that's important because um, these things will have universal coverage uh, in the sectors that they cover. And there will have been many, you know, going back to that earlier example of hospitality workers, there would almost certainly be parties, businesses and employees in that sector who hadn't had any real touch point with the bargaining process. And if you're then going to have put legally enforceable rules in place, um, you need to have a process like that. And so then therefore being very clear, if you're going to be applying these things through the law um, and um, uh, officers of the Crown having uh, powers to enforce, you need to be very clear about who is going to be subject to those powers and who is not going to be subject to those powers, uh, as well as achieving the benefits of the policy, of course. Um, so there had to be quite a bit of work, and I should have mentioned this when we we're talking about initiation as well, it's one of the steps then. There's quite an onus on the unions at the point of initiation uh, to be very clear uh, about um, uh, who, who was to be covered. Uh, by the proposed fair pay agreement. And uh, there is an ability through um, our particular occupational codes that we use in Australia and New Zealand. I, I think you use different occupational codes in the UK uh, to use those codes to provide greater specificity uh, about who will be covered. So there had been quite a bit of thought uh, gone into how that would occur. Uh, and there would then be an ability from our Labour inspectorate um, when things were further down the track uh, to determine who was covered and who was not, if that was in dispute. Um, in, in respect of the, the substance of what would be in fair pay agreements, perhaps I can start with what is, was not allowed to be in fair pay agreements because that was fairly simple. Um, we, we left this pretty open. Um, we said effectively, as, as long as you legally can't do it and you're not conflicting with any other uh, law of the land, uh, then it's permissible effectively to bargain any, any reasonable terms and conditions into a fair pay agreement. And that was important for us because, as I said before, um, this model was, yes, it was about lifting uh, pay conditions and well-being of workers, but it was part of a much bigger um, uh, attempt to reform that social contract and to shift our model of economic development. And so we're very keen to see unions and employers negotiate around staffing levels, uh, around skills and training and apprenticeships and health and safety and productivity. Those are things we we, we wanted to see in fair pay agreements. So there was full capacity um, for parties to agree uh, to those matters. Uh, there were certain conditions uh, listed in the legislation that were mandatory to agree uh, conditions. 
Um, and these were mainly the basics, pay, um, leave, uh, hours of work, uh, superannuation requirements in a number of other areas. Um, we did, um, as a result of advocacy during the select committee process, um, also add health and safety matters uh, as a mandatory to agree matter. That was something that was strongly pushed uh, by a number of unions. Uh, and that was significant because, yes, parties would have to include those things in there. Um, but even in the event that a fair pay agreement was not settled by the parties, then the Employment Relations Authority, which was the body which would arbitrate for fair pay agreements, um, had to also include those matters in a fair pay agreement. So there's sort of, if, if, an, if a, an employer grouping really, really didn't like the idea of having a fair pay agreement, they couldn't just sort of sabotage the process by not participating, because if they didn't do that, there would be an arbitration process and these matters would still have to be included uh, in the final product. So that was that was a very important part of the institutional design. So um, I, th I think if I, if I can uh, ask just one more, Cad, um, and that that's the question uh, that you've mentioned already: the um, strikes and arbitration. Could could you just say a word about the right to strike and the right to go to binding arbitration and how? they interacted under the legislation? This was a matter that was settled politically um, before we came into government uh, because it was it was the manifesto policy that we presented um, made it clear that industrial action um, would, would not be allowed in pursuit of fair pay agreements, that being, of course, either strike action or lockouts uh, from employers. And that, that was a judgment um, on, on a number of grounds. Um, one was um, ensuring that this was going to be um, a substantial reform that we could sell to the public and that uh, wouldn't be subject to scare campaigns uh, around widespread industrial action because we knew that would be one of the points of attack uh, from those who opposed the policy. Uh, and in truth, it was also a recognition that in many of the sectors where fair pay agreements were the most important well, they were coming into effect um, because of extremely weak union power in those sectors. So often these were sectors with small, isolated uh, groups of workers that were very hard to collectively organise and other barriers to organising were in place. So the reality in many of these sectors, frankly, was that even had there been a right to take industrial action, um, it may have been difficult uh, for it to have seen the light of day in any case. So that judgment was made before we came into office that industrial action would not be allowed in pursuit. Having made that decision, um, in, in my view anyway, um, you really have to have an arbitration, or as we called it in the legislation, a d determination function uh, to ensure that if bargaining became bogged down or if there was resistance, uh, there was a tool to ensure that, that fair pay agreements were settled. And in the absence of industrial action, that, that tool would be lacking. So that was a, a, an important design feature. Important to say in the New Zealand context, relatively novel. We, we, we over the last, since 1991, have had very limited experience of industrial arbitration for collective bargaining. I, I think the first uh, collective agreement to be settled uh, via arbitration since the 2000 legislation only happened about two years ago. So qu quite a new concept to, to reintroduce to the labour market. Um, and so as a part of the legislative design, we had to put it in place. And there were two points at which it could be triggered. Um, one was if bargaining became significantly frustrated, bogged down, not making progress, uh, then a party could apply uh, for there to be determination. And again, there were factors to be considered uh, before that was granted. Uh, the second uh, trigger um, was if there were two failed ratification votes. So after bargaining is completed, both workers, that is all workers, whether they are union members or not, on one side, and all employers on the other side participate in a ratification vote. If that fails once on either side, parties go back and negotiate. If it fails a second time, then the FPA would go straight to uh, determination. And so the determination policy was important, both in terms of making sure we got outcomes, we actually got FPAs. We didn't want things to drag out for years and years and years. Uh, but secondly, 
and this is how I thought it would most likely work, as a very powerful incentive for parties to sit down and bargain between themselves and get an outcome. Uh, because if they fail to do that, then they would lose to, to some degree control of the final outcome. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Michael. Fantastic. You've given us lots to think about uh, and many lessons for us to learn from when pursuing fair pay agreements um, in the UK. Having experienced the problems and possibilities of introducing the legislation in New Zealand, I'd like to ask as a final round of questions, are you still committed to the concept of fair pay agreements? And perhaps what's the most single most important lesson that we can learn from New Zealand's experience when trying to pursue it here in the UK? Absolutely. Um, there is just no doubt in my mind uh, that I, I speak to the New Zealand experience, but I, I know it, it mirrors yours to some degree, that the 30 to 40 year experiment with a deregulated labour market um, has been one of the most disastrous things um, for um, the dignity of the lives of working people, um, for economic productivity, um, and for our social uh, fabric. Um, uh, that deregulated labour market means that some of the people doing the most essential work in our societies are the most devalued and the most voiceless. Uh, and I think for just people of decency, um, let alone people who are committed to the dignity of labour, that's, that's something that can't stand. And, and I think you have to tackle it via structural reform. Um, uh, we've had a long history in New Zealand, um, and I think you have as well, of uh, many um, uh, policies which attempt to tackle the inequalities that develop um, post facto. Um, we have a, a massive system of tax credits called Working for Families, which attempts to deal with these problems after people have um, uh, have earned wages that are not sufficient to sustain decent lives. I actually think we've got to go back to the root problem, um, which is um, a lack of uh, voice and an imbalanced employment relations system. And sectoral-based, you know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel on the sectoral-based bargaining and the histories of both of our countries and uh, uh, in the contemporary era in many other countries um, is a very effective tool. Uh, for achieving this. Better outcomes for workers, uh, better productivity, better social dialogue. So I remain absolutely committed. Our party's at a point in opposition now where we're, we're working through exactly what our policies will be for the next uh, election, um, but I, I, I'm, I'm very certain uh, that a policy of this form uh, will be there, um, possibly with some reflection and some improvements when we take it to the electorate next time. Uh, lessons. Um, if you don't mind me being a bit cheeky, I'll give you two. <laughs> um, uh, the first is um, have some confidence when you go into this. Um, it, it's a big economic reform. Um, I've no doubt that it will face the same level of institutional resistance and misinformation as it did in New Zealand. Uh, but be confident that if you just front the core arguments solidly, uh, that decent people um, including most middle ground voters, uh, will understand this and they will support it uh, and don't feel that you need to be uh, defensive uh, about the policy. Um, be bold and be clear. And, and as I say, <laughs> while we lost the election in 2023 in New Zealand, um, this policy, despite facing vociferous attack at the time, wasn't really a feature of that campaign. It wasn't an unpopular policy. Um, well, that was sadly uh, then uh, removed by the incoming government. Um, the second major lesson um, is around speed to implementation. Um, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that once these are in place, they will benefit many, many workers. Um, they will become a part of the social fabric. People will see the value of them and they will therefore become politically durable. So, you know, move with some speed and confidence and, and get them implemented. Um, because I think that, you know, having done a trial run as uh, UK Labour is proposing, I think these will prove popular, they'll prove effective, and uh, more people will want them. Uh, and that will mean that this is a policy which can endure into the long term and becomes difficult for future Conservative governments uh, to unpick. So I would say move with some decisiveness on the policy. We only have a three-year election cycle, you have a five-year. If you legislate relatively quickly, you can make great progress uh, within that term. <laughs>
Thanks very much for that, Michael, uh, for such an inspiring and informed overview of the fair pay agreements in New Zealand. That was brilliant. Uh, your your ongoing faith in the system is encouraging, I have to say, and will inspire more confidence in us to go forward with the policy. As you rightly identified, Michael, the course of public opinion is in our favour in terms of this debate. Workers need a pay rise, and as we know, sectoral collective bargaining is the best way to deliver such a pay rise. So thank you for inspiring us and for giving us confidence. At IER, we will continue to work for the introduction of sectoral collective bargaining across the economy uh, as much as we can. Uh, and maybe in the near future, we can share our experiences with you, and we would very much look forward to doing that. So. Thank you again, Michael. It's been great speaking to you. Thank you for taking the time. It's been wonderful. Thank you and uh, all strength to your arm. <laughs>